Turn to Romans 8. Here's a great truth. I think you know this truth. A person learns eight, 800 times more in his retention center when he learns in humor. That's the latest statistic just out. That anyone that teaches good content and has people with content, I don't mean being frivolous or suggestive or corny, but I mean it has good content and is humorous. They tested it in through one particular professor, and they've started all across the country, come out with their test. Your retention is 800 times greater. That's just, that's just put out this, this morning. This figure, at least it's when I got it. Isn't that something? In other words, the teachers that teach good content and have humor, people found that they were retaining what the teacher said because the humor disarmed the stress and the occupational hazard of the details of life, if I can get this straight, or the hindrances of the time. And the information went direct into the retention center through the, the way it's supposed to, without self-effort. Just because of good listening and good receiving. Isn't that something? I thought it was unusual. When I heard the figure 800, I got up and wrote it down. Because I was in bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, woke up and prayed, and then couldn't go back to sleep and turned on television, that's the first thing I heard. I put on the lights and went up and wrote it down. It was that good, I thought. Okay. Now the doctrine of suffering. <laughs> Gout, hernia, liver, one lung, and every tooth has a filling, every one. And on top of that, rheumatoid arthritis, prostate problems, spinal column problems, throat problems. But besides all that, <laughs> first class shape. Now, Romans 8. By the way, I haven't got any takers yet on Susan, so please let me. She's right there. If you wanted to go out for coffee, just go and ask her. Her father really likes it that I'm doing this. He's edging me on through, through her brother-in-law. Well, but for him, <laughs> she's wearing better dresses all the time. I mean, dude. But what? <laughs> if you like green, ask her out. But what of that, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time, this present life, are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is about to be revealed in us and to us and for us and conferred on us. So this passage says, that before it goes into the, the three groans, it goes into this great principle that sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed to us. Anita, if you would get my radio Bible out, please, and turn to First Peter 1 in it and bring it up here. It's right there, hand, handy. Uh, so here we have the sufferings of this present time. Now, Often much has been said about suffering. Every seminary I've known has written reasons why Christians suffer. There are many books written on it, and they're good ones. They're all basic, but they're, they're good. But as a college class, it's important that you understand suffering. And we're going to try to make it fresh while we still build upon the true premise of facts. All right, number one. Suffering comes to man 
because of the fall. Suffering comes to man because of the fall. Uh, obviously, when man fell in the Garden of Eden, and by the way, when man did fall in the Garden of Eden, The Bible says he found he was naked. And the Bible doesn't mean that all of a sudden he looked at himself like a person would out here in the street and say, my land, I'm naked. <laughs> There's far much more to that little word naked. I mean, he'd been naked all of his life. But now that he'd sinned, what it meant was he recognized inside of himself a phenomenal shame and terrible guilt which caused pain. And he thought he could help it out by putting on fig leaves. How many understand that? Do you understand that? So, here we have the fall causing shame and causing pain. What actually Satan had teased Eve and successfully taken over Adam by saying, you will be an independent God. See, Satan always wants individuals to be independent. Now, there's nothing wrong with independence. We all believe in independence and thank God now for the, for the Russian countries. Baltics, the uh, Eastern Europe, and thank God for all the countries that are independent and receive their freedom to govern themselves. But we're not speaking of them this morning. We, we believe certainly in all of our freedoms and personal rights as people, but we're talking about being an independent God where there's no checks and balances over you. That's the kind of, of independence that Satan manipulated Eve to accept. That she would be an independent God. An independent God means that there will be no checks and balances over you. Now that's where people get manipulated by the devil. You shouldn't have any checks or balances or any bona fide authority. Do away with bona fide authority. Well, bona fide authority, as we teach, is given to provide, to protect, to empower, uh, to teach. So Satan comes along and he says, listen, you can be an independent God. You will be as gods. You will be as princes. You will be as an independent God. And you will reign as God, rule as God, without being under any bona fide authority. And he still whispers that to people today. Believe a priesthood does not mean that I don't have a bona fide authority. Believe a priesthood don't, doesn't mean I can do anything I want to. Believe a priesthood, yes, I stand or fall before God, but I do stand before God. I believe a priesthood has believe a priest rights, but he does stand before God. And that's, that's a lot. I mean, God said to Abraham in 17.1 of Genesis, walk before me. It's something to walk before God. So God is my authority. I have an authority. God is my authority. The Word of God is my authority. The Holy Spirit's my authority. And then God has human institutions of authority that are bona fide, as long as they don't invade my right to stand or fall before God. How many understand that? Now, there's a teaching across the nation today, and this is what it's teaching. We have entered into autonomy. We are adult sons. You might as well write this down so when you meet these people, you will be able to go, get ahead of them. Say, I want to teach you and get you to know things so that when people bring up stuff, 
you'll be, oh yeah, you'll say, let me tell you what you're going to tell me after that. Say, be offensive. Be offensive. You take over in graciousness. They talk about autonomy. And I, we all believe in autonomy. We all believe in freedom. Believer priesthood and so on. But they talk about autonomy. While they talk about autonomy, every single thing that they say is from a pope in their doctrines. You understand what I'm saying? That's not autonomy. They don't think for themselves. He could say, I got a new revelation this weekend in my office, and they would, they'd believe it Tuesday. He'd deliver it Tuesday. They'd accept it Tuesday. That's not autonomy. That's bondage. We have over a hundred different authors in that book. We have 12 different morning devotionals, or did have at one time, besides mine, you can choose from if you happen to want them. We have over a hundred different authors. That gives you what? Autonomy. And somebody was at a certain state out in Texas recently, and they told me, that they had no material but that man's material. None other. That's not autonomy, is it, President Satorius? No. Isn't that bondage? Isn't that maybe in an evangelical way submitting to a, a kind of a, I don't mean that he's a pope, but a kind of a pope, isn't it? Then they, then they talk about autonomy is sure you have a pastor teacher, but he can't invade your privacy. But he does have a table of organization. The college has a table of organization that is bona fide. So being independent doesn't mean violating the table of organization of the college or of the church. That's delegated authority. But that authority won't invade your privacy, but it will honor the word of God for its table of organization. How many understand that? Don't get mad when the table of organization is reinforced because that's an authority delegated by God through the scriptures for the organization to protect you in the organization so the organization will not decline in its quality of teaching and quality of life and deteriorate. How many understand that? All right. Now, why did I say that? Because there is much suffering because of acting as an independent God. There is much suffering because people act as an independent God with no bona fide authority. There is much unnecessary suffering and wasted pain because they don't have provision and protection of bona fide authority. Yes, they make their own decisions, and yes, they stand or fall before God. But the key words there are before God. <laughs> And I mean, he's supreme in the universe, and he delegates a pastor, and he delegates a table in the college, and he delegates a husband, you see, and he delegates teachers over at the day school and a, and a principal. He delegates. Now, they have to go by the word of God to implement the delegation, see. But that's the principle of bona fide authority, which is for our good. Thank God that the stop signs and red and green lights, can you imagine what it would be like without them? People that are egocentric that would say, everybody get out of the way. I'm going because I'm late to it. You just sit there and, and you never have your turn so you don't get to work. Thank God those lights are representing the authority of the police and stop signs. I'll never forget, I had this guy down in Maine years ago. He, he was a doctor and he graduated from an Ivy League college. And he came home at 3 o'clock in the morning and there was no one around, so he thought. And he went through a stop sign. Well, the police was lingering in the background, hiding from view. And they pulled up and he was going to get out because he was a doctor, medical doctor, and he graduated from this guy. He wanted to fight him. He said, but there's nobody coming. 
What do you think? I'm stupid. I don't have to stop. And the, and the police said, oh, really? He said, yeah, really? And he started to get out of the car. The police said, stay in the car. And they gave him the book. Oh, yeah. He figured because there was no one coming, why well, you have to stop? Wasn't doing any harm. He didn't want to honor the authority of the stop sign. <laughs> well, he suffered. Boy, what an illustration. <laughs> he suffered greatly. So we suffer in these bodies. Now, uh, the sufferings here have to do with the groans, the three groans, and the one main groan that we have is the groaning of the body. But I want you to see that in this suffering that we experience, that the Lord Jesus Christ has made it possible for us to understand clearly the doctrine of suffering. Now, let, let me show you quickly unnecessary suffering. Turn with me, and I'm going to use my Amplified. I have my King James here, plus I have the Greek here, plus I have the Amplified. You ought to be all protected. Well, anyway, turn to, turn to Proverbs 18.8. I want to show you from the Amplified. I thought yesterday in the little rap session in the snack bar that I was using the Amplified and come to find out I was using Zodiotis. And I thought, boy, there's a little, there's a word that isn't there that I thought was there. And I thought it was amplified, but it wasn't. They're both good. I just meant a particular word I was after. All right, 18.8. The words of a whisperer or tail bearer. Now, this word here is tail bearer is poison spreader poison spreader are as dainty mussels. they go down in the innermost parts of the cavity of the body now 2622 says the words of a whisper or slander are like dainty mussels, or words of sport to some but to others are like deadly wounds they go down in the innermost parts of the body for the victim's nature. Now, this, this teaches that if you listen to a tail bearer, to somebody that has poison about another person, that that causes death inside of you, and the death covers your whole system. That's why you don't listen to evil reports, because the words of a tail bearer, a poison spreader, go down into the whole soul and cause death. And then a person, just because he listened, enters into unbelievable suffering and doesn't even know why he's suffering. He's suffering because he listened to poisonous words and they cause death in his soul. And the rest of his life, he's the victim in his own nature of having poison that he received from a tail bearer about somebody else. And God doesn't appreciate it. That's an unnecessary reason for suffering. Many people suffer because of the weather, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods. People suffer because of the environment because of the environment. People suffer because of injustice, social injustice, judicial injustice. Our ministry suffered for righteousness sake because of judicial injustice and social injustice. We all suffered in a sense. We, we thank God for the privilege, but we, we did say we didn't suffer. And then we suffered the loss of our reputation because of social injustice and judicial injustice. See, all this suffering that goes on. 
then the word of God goes on to say that there is a suffering for the sake of righteousness. Matthew 5. When you suffer for righteousness' sake, or persecuted, be glad. Jump up and down. Rejoice. Now, suffering for righteousness' sake. Righteousness is a unique thing. I learned this morning that when Jesus Christ addressed the demons that caused the mad waves to come into the boat when he was riding on the boat in Matthew 8, the waves became mad. Now, sometimes demons of the air cause the storms, hurricanes, tornadoes are the mad weather signals of the fall. They're like mad dogs. Creation gets mad. Creation misbehaves because of the prince of the power of the air. Ephesians 2 too. Because Satan has a system of control with divine permission to test volition of men. So, creation gets angry and there's uncontrollable storms. Now, in this type of situation, Jesus got up and said, be muzzled. He was talking to a confederacy of demons that were causing the storm. And he said, be muzzled. He didn't say, peace, be still. He said, be muzzled. Now, immediately the storm listened to him. Why? Did he speak to the storm as a son of God? No. No, he didn't. He didn't speak to the storm as a son of God. No, he didn't speak to the storm as God. You say, well then, how did he have power over this, these demons, these mad ways. How did he have power if he didn't do it as the Son of God? He did it through perfect righteousness as a man. He did it through perfect righteousness of a man. Which tells me something. I've been thinking about this all morning. He did it as the Son of Man. He didn't do it. In that case, through God, he did it as a man. As a man, he had perfect righteousness and perfect righteousness wins victories over demonic activity now Jesus went about doing good divine good healing the sick casting out demons taking away oppression in Acts 10 38 he did that in his perfect righteousness as the son of man now, God has showed me something. That when I have imputed righteousness as my absolute premise for everything that goes on, and I have imparted righteousness through theantric action, governmental, categorical doctrine with the right pastor teacher and the right local assembly, when I have imparted righteousness, rightly divide the word of truth in categorical doctrine, Isaiah 28, 9 and 10, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, with 2 Timothy 2, 15 and 16. When I have imparted righteousness as my experience derived from the Holy Spirit and from doctrine in 2 Peter 1, 3 to 10, then I have a new authority over demons. It's not mine. It's derived. And if you understood that, you would have a much greater authority than you've ever had over sickness that is caused by them, when it is caused by them. You would have an authority over finances. You would have an authority over the, over the weather. I mean, if you needed to. I mean, let's say a storm moved in here, it was a hurricane. You have an authority to say, I, don't, I rebuke this. I don't want it to come nigh my dwelling place. I literally mean this. You exercise and a God-given 
authority of righteousness. We know we're not righteous in ourselves. We know we're going to use recovery today. But we exercise righteousness. Impart it. And we enjoy the provision of the imputed robe of righteousness which covers us. I mean, you think of when a man who has no self-righteousness, thank God, who doesn't rely upon himself at all, who doesn't defend himself, who doesn't exalt himself. Now, exalting yourself is quite a thing because Job, I think it's 33, 15, 16. hope I can get this right because I haven't heard it for a long time. But it says, He openeth their ear and seals their heart with instructions. He opens their ear and seals their heart with instructions that they may not turn aside, that they avoid discipline by the operation of theantric action. Now I'm putting theantric action in there as a synonym, but that's what the original Hebrew says. That is what it says. God opens your ears. See, when I concentrate and, and ask him, he opens my ears. Then he seals my instructions. That's where joy and humor come in. You receive retention 800 times more than you do when you're not relaxed. He protects you from being turned aside and getting disciplined by having you function in the application of categories through the power of the Spirit and theatric action. That's when you function in a derived righteousness and you have authority power over the enemy. How many understand that? It's a very important thing. If we realized and recognized the authority we have through our imparted righteousness and our imputed righteousness, I told my consultant group today, I expect this to be my best day. I have determination. I have conviction. I have purpose. Three dimensions of time will not condition my happiness. Three dimensions of time will not condition any part of my life. Neither, neither will geographical location. God will process my life from the eternal viewpoint today with a fixed heart of absolute happiness that is going to be happier than yesterday because I'm growing. And I purpose that. And that gives me self-esteem, which gives me confidence and a new boldness in exercising my derived righteousness, my derived life. How many understand that? Therefore, we suffer because of the judicial system and because of the social injustices of our time. Another reason we suffer is because of the amazing angelic conflict and we've we've taught you that through the years but it's we're teaching Romans 8 we must have it in your notes first Peter 1 12 3 17 Ephesians 3 9 to 13 and Job 1 and Job 2 so we suffer because of the angelic contest the angelic contest many of us suffer so that God can demonstrate in us the grace that he's taught us that's 2 Corinthians 12, 9 to 11. Many of us suffer so God can demonstrate the grace in us that he's taught us through scriptures. Many of us suffer because we marry the wrong person. Ezekiel 16. Now, don't you say, yeah, that's happened to me. Somebody hears this somewhere overseas or here will say that. Probably everybody will. I'm joking. No, they won't. Majority of our people are very happy. They only fight three or four times a day. 
And then they always rebound. They're very spiritual. But uh, <laughs> our folks get along. I'm just teasing in case an outsider hears this and thinks that's true. But <laughs> I haven't had a fight for so long. I can't remember when. Because I isolated them and it was over. <laughs> well, if you isolate it and bury it, you can't remember it. So never happened. <laughs> So if a, if, a, if a Christian suffers because of a wrong marriage, what he must do is reverse that. You know, down in Berwick years ago, and it's interesting how many people years later came up with this. Re and I'm glad they did. I'm glad a certain person did. I preached in psychology down there. I pre how many was there when I used to preach psychology? I preached divine reversals. Years later, from another pulpit that changed into providential reversals. That's not nothing wrong with that. I, I just mean divine reversals came from our vocabulary down in Bilwick in the psychology and the Bible classes. You understand that? So if I bring up divine reversals, don't think I'm bringing up from somebody else. Okay. Yeah, we taught a whole series on divine reversals through the mind. Sovereign reversals, redemptive reversals that cause rehabilitation, restoration, and all that. All right. Now, it's a beautiful thing when you have a bad marriage and you turn a bad marriage by cooperating with grace and the sovereignty of God in a divine reversal where you get well, let's say a person made a mistake in getting married okay and instead of being miserable they turn that mistake into a way to get blessed forever by being positive toward Jesus Christ and by cooperating with the nature of God by submitting to it and by deriving their life from Jesus in details of life in that marriage. They end up blessing God, being a testimony before the angels, the elect, causing problems for the fallen angels, blessing the guilty party, getting edified, and being rewarded forever for details of life during that day. You tell me that isn't a wonderful divine reversal. Suffering turned into a divine reversal. Now, I remember in Berwick we spoke about something that re uh, reminded me of it. We spoke about the particle day in Ephesians 4, how you keep on receiving the word of God, logical succession. And then we went, in, went, went into a iterative present tense you repeat you repeat hearing the word of God for your mind all the time in Ephesians 4.23 you keep on receiving the newness of mind you become new in species uh, the iterative present means repeated action and, and then you put off the old man it's a consitive heiress it means everything about Adam is put off consitive heiress anyway that's what we went into many many years ago and uh we called it a divine reversal where the mind gets healed, which in turn heals the emotions, which in turn brings a brand new subjective life, which in turn gives free volition happiness to choose properly, which the conscience honors because it's filled with grace. And self-consciousness is happy because it's occupied with Jesus. Well, that's a divine reversal for a, for a damaged good person that has damaged goods. And if he approaches it with a childlike faith. You know, Sunday night when I said, read the scriptures, that perfect love casts out fear. I mean, anybody in that audience that night with childlike faith is rid of fear. Right? Said, the little child says, I mean, Jesus said that? Yeah, it's right here. Then it's just cast out my fear. That's what child, see, childlike faith says, then it's gone.
because God's truth is absolute, and he said it, and I believe it, and I'm applying it by grace through faith, so the fear is gone. I don't have to be counseled. The fear is gone. Based upon the word of God, living by it. What's so hard about living by what God says and applying it and then enjoying the benefits? Because it causes divine reversals. Anyone with sickness should go toward their sickness with childlike faith and say, God loves me. He wants me to be healthy. Okay. That's it. And for any other reason, he has another part of sovereignty of his plan. He'll, he'll witness it to you and you'll be happy with whatever it is. So we have suffering because of what? What did we just say? What? Marriage. Wrong marriages. And we turn that into something good. Now, we're going to bring back very quickly, and I have many more things to mention on suffering. Of course, we suffer terribly because of wrong decisions. Terrible suffering because of wrong decisions. In Deuteronomy 30, 15, comes to me. Choose life that you may live. If you choose death, you will live under a curse. Your blessings will be cursed. Wrong decisions. Choose you this day, principle. Choose every day right decisions. We suffer so often because we allow a damaged soul to remain damaged by not applying the word of God in childlike faith that would heal us. He sent the word to heal us. We remain damaged goods and explore what causes it using time as a sequence to find out instead of accepting eternal truths before time which takes care of time and we don't let the eternal life take care of the time and the damaged goods so we search out the problem in time and we say we are wounded all right that brings me to the next point we suffer because God wounds us. In Jeremiah 30, 14 through 19. God, Micah 1, 9. Now, God doesn't wound people unless they refuse to accept his word, his grace, and his plan for their life. And they go negative toward him. When they do that, he wounds them. And I'll guarantee you these people that God have wounded have a scapegoat on earth and they're blaming somebody down here. It's not people down here. God did the wounding. And if God didn't do the wounding, if people did it, he can intervene because they have to go through God in order to wound you. Do you agree that anybody has to go through God to hurt you? Therefore, if they have to go through God to hurt you, who did the wounding? If that's the case. All right. So that would get, do away with our human scapegoats, what daddy did and what mummy did and what grandpapa did and what pastor did and what the teacher did and what the school did, all that stuff. Then, Matthew 7, 29 through 8 is a fantastic principle of people suffering through 8, 13 because they will not accept bona fide authority. You'll find that in Jeremiah 7 and Proverbs 30. They resist, go negative, and reject divine, divinely delegated authority. So they suffer terribly because they lose provision and protection. Of course, we suffer from discipline, chastisement, so that God can bless us afterwards in Hebrews 12, 6 to 11. Now, we also suffer in the process of dying in Job 5, 20. Ecclesiastes is a book that says we suffer because of the details of life. Don't have to but we do if we do not go to God. I think the Pharisees suffered in John 5, 39 and 40 in 
in Matthew 23, they suffered because they rejected the word of God as a word of life and grace. Often we suffer emotionally. And John 20 is a good chapter on that. 9 to 18, we suffer emotionally because we have emotions that are regulated by Adam, by people, by circumstances and pressures of life and therefore our emotions respond negatively and we suffer. Well, Father, dismiss us now in Jesus' name, amen.